Okay, good morning, good Monday morning, and we pick somebody very special to motivate you for Monday morning, Our Architects of Change Live, conversations with change makers who are moving humanity forward. And I'm really honored uh, that this morning we're here to talk with DeRay McKesson, who has written this really great book. I read it on the plane last night coming back from Chicago, On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope. And I thought on this Monday, after such a raw weekend, yeah. after such a tumultuous week as we had last week, the case for hope is a really great place to start. And I wanted to um, ask you, Ray, where does your hope come from? What do you have hope about? Because a lot of people are feeling pretty hopeless. When I think about hope, I think about hope as a belief that our tomorrows can be better than our today's, you know? Mm -hmm. And mine is sort of born in the classroom. I used to teach sixth grade math. That's right. Is it AmeriCorps? I mean, a Teach for America Uh, teacher uh, and uh, was on the front lines in teaching. So thank you for your service because I'm a big believer that we should all be of service in yeah. some capacity. So Teach for America is a way of being of Teaching service. Teaching was huge to me. And every day I walked in and saw kids learn more than they knew the day before. And that was like a big part of it. And the second part is I know that like this is man-made, that God didn't make earth man and white supremacy, right? That like <laughs> people made these things up. So when I think about like the rewrite of the tax code, it's like they did the biggest rewrite of the tax code on scrap paper and paper tiles. Don't tell me that the things we're fighting for have to take 200, 300 years. We can actually do this. We can make it happen. And when I think about what it means to empower people, right. that's like going into places and helping people realize that they have power. Like you, you already have the power before mm-hmm. I got there. So when I think about this, this recent, uh, you know, hard week with these hearings and, right. and the national conversation, it's like, I'm always reminded that like we made this system and we can make something better. So when we say the system is broken and people say, Oh no, it was designed to be like this. My takeaway is that it was designed like people made it up and people can make it better. So how would we make it better? I was really struck by um, the comment last week, uh, it was on Friday, uh, from um, Senator Coons about that there's an ocean of pain out there on both sides uh, with you know blacks and whites, with Latinos, with men, with women, between Democrats and Republicans, just this ocean of pain, this huge divide that is going to be there after this FBI investigation is over. Investigation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> after um, after it all, there's going to be this huge ocean of divide. And when I talk about trying to be a part of a movement in healing it, people go like, yeah, right. You know, no, it's not going to happen. We're done. We're finished. It's all gone to hell in a handbasket. It's hard to heal a divide when so many people don't have their basic needs met, right? Right. So you think about, like, what does it mean that, like, we don't have a country where every single kid can eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? It's hard to talk about healing in that context. What does it mean when we don't have a country yet where every kid can read and write? Like these are things that we can, we should be able to guarantee and we should talk about. So when I think about how the pain is manifesting differently, there's a set yeah. of people who the pain is manifesting because they are trying to get to tomorrow. You know, they're just trying to figure right. out how to get to tomorrow. There's another side that is like calling it pain, but they are really just trying to maintain their supremacy and um, hegemony over other people. And that's not really pain. So we think of make America great again. That's not pain. That is people saying that like we want to maintain our position at the top of this ladder, not we want to create a world of equity and justice. But what if we came from the place that we had faith that people want to create a world of um, equality and justice? If we started from that place uh, on this Monday, what what are the steps we need to do to get to that place? If we started from just the belief that, look at there is this pain, I'm not gonna qualify yours, you don't qualify, but, but we wanna make it better. We wanna get to freedom, we wanna get to equality. What do we? What do you think we have to do? Do we need to listen more? Yeah, do I think we, that, I don't know, I wanna push only because like our experience has shown push, us that I people's love it. like, you yeah. know, so when you are waving the Confederate flag and mm-hmm. you are having a rally uh, talking about white nationalism, yeah. that is not about, that's not, me validating that as pain yes. is actually me participating in something right. that's really well, dangerous. Well, I agree with you, you know on I mean? that. Yeah, so let's put them to the side. There's a lot of them, though. Yeah, well, <laughs> so More I think of them than I think people want But I think admit. there are more people who want. Yes, uh, yes. Who are of the belief, and I see it all the time, who want something to believe in, who want to believe uh, in their fellow human being, who want to do good, 
Uh, so when we think about those people, I yeah. do think some of it is listening. I think some of it is like being really clear about how do we create entrances for people that so much of our work as activists and organizers is thinking about like, how do I put you in a space for you to understand? So when I think about social right. welfare programs now, I don't preach to people about the importance of social welfare programs. I'll say to people who disagree with me, tell me what a seven year old has to do to earn dinner. Like, you tell me, right? Mm -hmm. What does a four-year-old have to do to earn a place to sleep tonight? You know, like, it just doesn't make sense. Right. And so much of our work is, like, helping people just see it differently. Like, right. pulling them in so it's like, this is not about me attacking something. This is about me thinking, you know, I, I spent a lot of time around the police. And I was on a panel once with a police officer, and she said to me, Dre, the, there's a lot of crime, da, da, da. Are you saying the police should never kill somebody? Yeah, you write about that in the book. And I yeah. say to her, you know, when should the police kill your child? And she's like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, well, I don't know either, right? If you don't, if you don't want to think of a scenario where, like, mm -hmm. your kid's going to make a mistake and a police officer should be able to pull a bullet through his head, then, like, no parent should have to do that, right? So, so much of our work is, like, building empathy by, like, having other people think through some of the issues that don't necessarily affect them. When right. I think about the issues around gender that are coming out, in this last week mm -hmm. is that with men you know when I'm talking to them I'm saying like tell me the last time you felt unsafe right. that there are a lot of like straight men who are like uh, you know I feel safe all the time and you're like yeah. you ask a woman the last time they felt unsafe and it's like they can think of a million experiences where they felt unsafe in their body or unsafe in their mind and like helping people like see that the way they live in the world isn't the only way that people live in the world so I that's think is a, a part big of it. step I think and I've had that conversation I have four brothers and so I always talk about you know you don't even have a clue like well, I don't want to park in an underground parking lot and they're like what's wrong with you and I'm like I feel unsafe right. in an underground parking lot don't when you, you get cat called yeah you know, like and so they don't that's not their experience and when I talk to them about they're like wow I never kind of thought of that so there's a lot of I never thought of that or when you have the experience of Judge Kavanaugh and like his rage so for a lot of women that's like whoa you know I've you'd be kicked out of a meeting yeah you, well but also you know, the feeling of that rage. So how do we begin to kind of create this empathy that you're talking about so we can begin to heal the divide so that we can get to the hope? Yeah, I think some of it is naming the things we see. So with Kavanaugh, right, right when you see it, it's like, you know, I'll never forget watching the hearings and seeing him cut off Senator Leahy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if I was ever in a professional setting and, and like responded to somebody like that, there's right. no way that I'd be able to, like it just would be a non-starter, right? right? You two. And for like, women, yes, yeah, absolutely. Or the way he spoke with uh, uh, Senator Kabucher, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Klobuchar, yeah. excuse me, yeah, that that was like, yeah. whoa. It'd be, it'd be, um, there's no scenario where that'd be acceptable for, for either of us, right? right? So some of that is like naming that and, and pulling that out bare so that people have to like, talk about it and adjust right. and that's uh, not a partisan thing that's not a political thing yeah. that's just a a human thing yeah. right so or even you know could you imagine if a lawyer spoke to him in his courtroom the way that he spoke to those senators yeah. he would hold them in contempt you know like the, the naming the double standard is actually a key part of this work you know people talk about truth and reconciliation without understanding that the truth has to come before the reconciliation right so that's a really great i think uh point i was i was in rwanda this summer uh, and watching what they did in their reconciliation in their country. So I think naming, not being so defensive, all of us, um, naming what uh, we feel, na allowing other people to name their experiences, and then getting to the reconciliation part of it. Yeah, but there's so many people who want to do the reconciliation without doing the truth part, right? right. And there's no way you know, if we're ever going to move past the ills of racism, we actually have to talk about the way that it manifests and the way that sexism manifests and the way, you know, like, we have to deal with that gritty stuff. So when I think about even in the book, it's like talking about some of the stuff around the police. It's like, you know, in California, right. there's a law that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline regardless of the outcome. That just isn't fair, right? right? You can love the police and still say that's not fair. Do you know what I mean? In Cleveland, they destroy police officer disciplinary records every two years. That's just not fair, you know? Right. And until we deal with those structural things, it doesn't so matter So that's how also educating. Yeah. Educating, coming back to your teaching roots. So educating people that that exists, that not only is that perhaps that's not fair, that's not right yeah. in this country, right? So that should change. Yeah. And the more people know, the more tools they have. You know, I think about in Maryland, there's a law that says that you can file an anonymous complaint against an officer for everything except brutality. 
Wow, I did not know that. And you're like, that just, there's no scenario where that, like, is defensible, right? So you ran for mayor in, uh, in Baltimore. I used to live in Baltimore for two years. And I loved that you kind of went and I'd do it again, even though you lost. And what did you learn from that process? And why would you advocate for others to run? Yeah, you know, I know that we have to be as organized on the inside as we are on the outside, that we can't just fight the people in power. We got to be those people. And I think that that has to be a part of the strategy that for so long we've thought about our power as like showing up and shutting down things and, and going to the meetings. Sometimes we just have to be the people in those roles who already believe in equity and justice, who already have a stance. So I think that's part of it. What I learned is that nothing replaces just good old organizing, that nothing replaces like talking to people, knocking on doors, those are like the best things. I think that if I had to do it again, I wouldn't, I went to a lot of forums, I went to a lot of those things, and like, you know, the people who show up to those things sort of have their mind made up already. Yeah. It was the people who like had nobody had ever knocked on their door in 30 years, right. right? Those are the people that like really made it an experience. Um, so so I learned a lot about that and fundraising. You know, we did some, a lot of small dollar donors. So mm -hmm. there'd be days where like I'd make $5,000, days I'd make $20, days I'd make $40,000. So like that was, I learned a lot about how we, how you budget in a context where like we're not getting any big checks. What did you learn? And I, I've uh, knocked on a lot of doors uh, in my life. Some have been slammed shut in my face. I In Maryland, my uh, brother was running for the Congress uh, in Maryland. And uh, sometimes people are really happy to see you at the door, and sometimes, sometimes they're not so really <laughs> not uh, happy. Um, or they're skeptical. They're like, why are you at my door? Well, doing? sometimes they're not happy right. about it at all. <laughs> so w what did you learn about people by knocking on doors? I think that uh, you know, the biggest lesson was that people want to be heard, right? That people right. do have a story about what... Uh, the city could be, you know, like, you know, the things that are their issues. So it was a lot of, it was interesting to hear people talk about crime and acknowledge, like, the city is dangerous for so many people. We don't think the police are the solution, but we don't know what the solution is. And having to talk about that or hearing parents yeah. say, you know, I, I, like, worry every day I put my kid on the bus stop. You know, just hearing the stories actually yeah. made it really different. And seeing how common some of the experiences were across neighborhoods, right? That these weren't isolated, but these are, like, the same experience. And there were so many people in the city who, like, nobody, you know, they've been voters for 40 years, 50 years, wow. and nobody had ever knocked on their door. They'd never gotten a call before. Um, so that was really interesting. And I will say one of the coolest things is, like, right when I first announced, somebody hit me up on Twitter, she DM'd me, and she was like, Dre, I, I want to do a house party. I, we don't, we, like, I've never met you. And she literally filled up her house with people in the neighborhood. People are, like, sitting on the stairwell, and like we did, we that was the first one, but we did like five or six like house events. Uh -huh. And like that just isn't, that's like new to Baltimore. That's not right. how like Baltimore normally organizes. Uh, and it was really beautiful. So uh, I wanted to talk to you, because this book I was reading, I thought it was really, um, you know, he has these great quotes at the top of each uh, chapter and he goes through, um, you know, the problem with the police, definitions of hope and freedom, finding issues, you know, that you care about, how to get involved. and. What is it that made you want to write this book? What What did you think this book would do for where we are? You know, it's interesting. I was listening to a sermon, and the sermon was titled, Don't Tell Your Story Too Soon. And I remember being yeah. like, perfect title. And I listened to it, and what he says is that sometimes you can tell your story so soon, all you see is the pain and not the purpose. And if I had written a book three years ago would have been about the pain of protest. I knew that really well because I was in the street early, like I'd been to most of the cities. Yeah, I, and he was protesting, That's and I asked him about this, excuse me for interrupting, yeah, yeah. this vest which he wore in all the protests, yeah. and uh, you you put it on, I read, to keep you grounded all the time to remind you. It reminds me that like what we went through was real, you know? Right. And I think about like, if I had written a book three years ago, it would have been about the pain of protest. That's what I knew best. Mm -hmm. I hadn't yet been able to step back and say, here are the lessons, here are the themes, right? Here are the things I want to share. And, and that's what the book is. So it's a collection of essays, some about protest, some about the police, some about things, you know, I write about my mother. That chapter's called, I Can Remember Her Now Without Sadness. She left when I was three, came back when I was 30. And one of the reasons wow. it was important for me to write about her and like my experience with her, Joan, is that like I know that we walk into every room carrying more than we always name, right? <laughs> Amen. And with her, I'm always carrying this issue of like, what does it mean to be worthy? It's just like what's always in the room that if she could leave, anybody could leave. That's sort of like how it showed up in my life. And part of my own growth has had to has had to be able to name that. 
And then to say like, how do I, how does that come in the room with me and not hurt you? How does it not hurt me anymore? What does that mean? And what's the power of memory? The way that we remember the past and the, the way we think about the future actually changes the way we think about our own power. So it's those things. And, and even, um, you know, I write about being gay and what does it mean to be a gay black man in a movement? What does it mean to be mm -hmm. gay in this context? Uh, so it's a range of essays that deal with like the things I've learned. I think that's so beautiful what you just said. How do I name what happened to me and how do I bring that in the room and not have it hurt you, the other person? How did your struggle with worthiness hurt other people in the room? Because to get to that place, which you just said, tells me you've done a lot of work to get yeah, there. Yes, so you, you know, it, could, it, it has manifested in a host of ways over the years, but you think about, like, what does it mean to demand to be heard not because you have something to say but because like being heard is really important when like you don't feel like you are valued right that like so that it shows up like that sometimes or like what does it mean to take up too much space just because you like want to take up space because like you you need people's validation that like you matter and those sort of things so now I'm in a place where I know I can like name it you know I'm like this is what I like see it I know what it's I know what I'm feeling and like I just don't need to say that or I don't need to do that or like I do need to do this and like this is why it matters, but it took a lot for me to say, oh, that's where it comes from. You know what I mean? This Beautiful. idea that like, or how do I like actually build deep connections with people, right? There was a period of time where like, I just didn't build deep connections because like you were going to leave anyway, you know? Right. It's like if she could leave, you could leave. Yeah. And like now it's like, I'm not afraid of you leaving, right? That like we grow, we move, and I'm, I can still build an incredibly deep relationship with you without the fear of loss. You write in here, which I think is so beautiful um, about people who made a difference in your life that didn't have to. Um, and, you know, we often think teachers that way, but you, you write about um, people who made a difference in your life that didn't have to. And I think that's also such a powerful thing. All of us have the ability to make a difference in somebody else's life. We don't have to, but we can. Yeah, and like, what does it mean to pay it forward? You know, yeah. that like, so I think about all the activists, the people that I met in the streets who like, you know, it doesn't take a lot for me to like help them out with this thing or connect them with this person or do that because that's what a, a part of the work, right? And I do it with the spirit that like, you don't owe me anything, you owe the space something. That like, when you get to a place when you can connect the next person or you can like put this person in a place where they can do their best work, you need to do that. And that when we all pay it forward, we actually just make the whole space better. And I think about all the people, you know, only this year, uh, earlier this year is the first time I have lived alone in my own place in support disorder. I've essentially been living with family in their basement for the past three years. And like, there were people who were like, Dere, you can stay. And I'm like, thank you, you know? There were people who, when wow. I was like super broke, like help me get food. And it's like, now I'm in a place where like I wrote a book and, and I travel and things like that. So it's like, I can help other people now too. And like, that has to be a part of the work. So you write at the end here, letter to an activist. And um, I find that so many people uh, want to do something to make the world better, but they don't know how. And in this chapter you wrote about, which I thought was really good, you said, you know, it's hard to, if you don't know the issue, if you don't have experience with it, it's hard to get in there and do something about yeah. it. So to me, it's kind of, um, you know, a call to people to like find out about different things. To and like have follow your curiosity. Yeah, you know? your curiosity. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, and also this poet Cleo Wade saying, not every ground is a battleground. I love that. I love that because we're all fighting, but maybe not every ground is a battleground. Isn't that great? Like, yeah. When I read her, I was like, that is good. Damn, girl. I was like, that is good. <laughs> you know, I. I'm less interested in how people identify and I'm more interested in the work they do. So mm -hmm. whether you call yourself an activist, an organizer, I'm more interested in your work. And what people never saw with us in St. Louis is like the first things that we did were like not glamorous, right? The first thing I ever did in St. Louis was make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I make a mean peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So you go. just went to be there. Just to volunteer, just to right. like help. To okay, see so that's really, happening. so, but I thought in the book you were like, I had a free weekend. Yeah, yeah, I just... I'm gonna go witness, right? Uh, so I right. got there and I was like, well, I need to do something. I can't just like stand around, you know? So like I was I was on the sandwich team and I'm making sandwiches. And then, you know, while we're making sandwiches, we're talking, building relationships. And like, that's how almost all the best organizing happens. It's like me and you sitting in the living room being like, did you see that crazy thing? And you're like, did you see that? And then we're like, what can we do about it? Like it starts small. So people should right. be okay with the starting small. But that I think is very important. So you didn't, you just went to be helpful. Yeah. You went 
to witness. You went because you had a free weekend, as she said. Yeah. And you never came back. And like that has to be, people need to be okay with like starting small is yeah. actually just the way it all starts. Right. You just didn't see, you didn't see me sleeping on the side of the road in the car at night. You didn't see me on people's random air mattresses. Like you see me now in an interview with you. But like it starts small. The second is that people need to follow their curiosity. I get too many people who are like, Dre, I want to work on ending mass incarceration. I'm like, what about ending mass incarceration? They're like, ending mass incarceration. I'm like, well, that, like, yeah. what about the justice system like riles you up? What yeah. about prisons do you think is bad? Like, because when I know where your passions are, I can actually align you just better to where the issues are that you can work on because Lord knows there's enough going on. Yeah. So that's the second. And the third is that like, you know, we think about freedom as not only the absence of oppression, but the presence of justice and joy. So like, we can tear down all the bad stuff but we also have to be around to build up the good things right. and so much of what we need to do as activists is like dream big is like make the big ask you know like mm -hmm. what does it mean to think of like how would you configure a world where every kid can eat breakfast lunch and dinner like we should have those big big dreams those are conversations that are aspirational we i define that architects of change are people who challenge what is imagine what can be yeah. and then move humanity forward so the the if you're not kind of thinking of that everything's a battleground and everything's a fight you can get to a place of like starting to imagine is that something that you want to advocate for for people to start imagining what that have kind to. of dream we'll looks never like never get to the other side of freedom if people don't have like a some vision even if it's messy you know that like one of the things that's different about the right and the left is that uh, for so many people on when you think about make america great again that that's about like nostalgia memory and recall there's nothing innovative in that that's like repackaging messaging that we've heard before well, and you also talk about for so that that kind of phrase is offensive to so many people oh, first, yeah. because the past wasn't great wasn't great for so <laughs> many people i thought that was a really good point when that you think you about the here. left is that we are always engaged in make believe that like, well, we, we're trying to like help people see a world they've never seen before. And that's just hard. Telling stories about a world that you've never experienced right. is like hard work. So when I think about like what the best activists do is that they practice the story of the future. That like we're trying to so tell So what's people, the story of the future? I oh, love that. I think that we can live in a world where the police don't kill people. I, I can imagine a world where like everybody has access to a doctor. There's a quality doctor. It doesn't have to wait long to get an appointment where like kids go to school and they learn how to rewrite and think in critical ways and that like we empower parents and we equip parents to be real educators at home in ways like I can imagine all of those things because I know we can do them but telling you a story about them and saying like here's how we do it like that's actually just hard and I think that some of our politicians are much better at the the how than the what they can tell us about funding allocations and stuff like that and not not paint a picture but we got to paint the picture so so many people I know um, there's this whole debate now do you need rage actually to get something accomplished do you need to be kind of out of your mind do you need to see everything as the battleground and we're all in a fight do you think that's necessary to to create to actually bring this world that you imagine or maybe the world that I imagine to fruition do we need to see it as a battleground and be furious and full of rage I think that you need a sense of urgency and right. sometimes, so that's different. Do you think we need rage? Well, sometimes the urgency shows up as rage, right? Sometimes the urgency shows up as, like, intense patience, right? That, like, you know, I think about there's some moments when, like, when I'm in the middle of the street and the police are being wild, like, there's, like, a rage there because it's, like, you didn't need to tear against us, right? When I'm in a meeting and I hear somebody say something that needs to be challenged, my urgency is, like, I'm not going to let you get off the hook with that. And it's not rage in that moment, but it's, like, no, you don't get to say that. Like, you don't get to do that. So I think that, the, I think that understanding that there's something at stake... Yeah, um, that's my son. <laughs> I, well, it's good. You know, yeah, better, you go. better your son than somebody else. <laughs> um, understanding that there's something at stake mm -hmm. and that, like, we got to fight as hard as possible right now, I think that those two things are important. So sometimes the anger is there. Sometimes the rage is there. But what is always there is, like, the urgency. You write in here, which I thought was also... Um, um, and I wrote it down, is that for many people, their first language was violence. The first language of the country was violence. Yeah, so you like, write that. And I hadn't seen that um, described as such, that the first language of the country was violence. What do you mean by that? That like when we, you know, in that, looking here. it's I'm in the author's listening note. listening to him. I'm just trying to find where it's I It's in the it. author's note, this idea that language is a oh, first it's, act. Oh, it's okay. It's, it's in, in the, the author's, author's note. note. Yeah. Okay. That language is a first act and... Um, and the first language of this country is violence. Yeah. It's like one of the, I mean, the corollaries at yeah, the Yeah, violence end. was the first language of this country. It's still the first language of many people. But it doesn't have to be the language we teach our children 
or whose tempo guides our steps. You know, there are two ways that we can conceive of power. One is this idea of power over, and power over says that yeah. power is like a finite pizza pie, that like the goal is always to get as many slices as possible. And like you want to get more than me, like that's what power looks like. There's another version that is called power with that says that power right. is infinite and expansive and that like we don't lose when we share. You know what I mean? So when I think about this idea that, that violence was the first language of the country, it's like what does it mean that like we're rooted in like the destruction of the Native Americans, like enslavement for so many people is like that is like what built this wealth. That is what like allowed prosperity to happen in the way that this country was built. And that to reckon with that is like real work and that there's no way that we can think about the other side of freedom that doesn't reckon with that. That the extreme income inequality, wealth inequality, isn't just like happenstance, you know? It was designed to be like this. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we undo that is to reckon with the past and say like, you know, we're actually gonna teach a new language. A new language is gonna be equity. And we think about the difference between equality and equity, that equality is a notion that everybody gets the same thing. Equity is that people get what they need and deserve. And like, we'll say that, that's what, that that'll be our new language. That's how we like walk into rooms now. Like we could do that, that's a choice. That's beautiful, um, what he just said. I think that's something that, you know, is not, is humane, is human, right? It's not political, it's not divisive. Do you think we need to walk into the room now without a political party, without a DNR on our backs? Well, I think that one party is so questionable that I want to make sure I'm not walking next to those people when I walk into the room. Um, but I do think it's time for us to just like expand our understanding of like what the party system can be. That like right. for so many people, uh, neither party is actually home right now. But right. because that is the only way the system is constructed, they sort of got to pick and choose. I think it's time. Time to just say like maybe there's another party. Maybe Are that. Are you starting a third party? Is that I'm, what your announcement is? I'm an is? independent. Okay. I'm in it. I was raised and uh, you know my whole life as a Democrat, and just found that uh, there were you know uh, as I was first lady of this state that there were people in both parties that had common sense that wanted to do good that saw themselves as public servants. I'm not talking about extremes on either side, and that there were extremes on either side, and that I found it was easier to talk to people from it being an independent yeah. and I do believe that we should have a third party because I, I think that the third party pushes uh, both parties and I thought you know certainly you know the bipartisanship we saw with Senator Flake on Friday used to be the norm now people are shocked when they when they right. saw that and how do we get it took to a, a lot place? of pressure to even get him to that yeah, place you know? right but how do we get to a place um, where that's common and I think a third party or somebody who might be able to you know be a third person in the room and say hey you know what about this Are you or what about that no I'm just here interviewing you <laughs> I'm here interviewing you I'll say, I heard talking it first. to you about the I'm other like, side I heard of it freedom first. I want to get to a place though where I think you know where um, I imagine something better than what we have. I right. imagine a place, uh, you know, I have four kids. I have two boys, two girls. As I wrote in my Sunday paper, I want a place where my daughters are believed and my sons uh, are also believed, you know. I want a place where your, your family has the same advantages as mine. And I don't think that that's too much to ask I for. Agree. I don't, and I do believe that that's possible. And, and we should I ask do. in public. We should start making yeah. these demands And I think public. that we want, we want that for our children. You know, I want a better country. Uh, for our children. I want, um, you know, I'm sure, what, and I do believe that the vast majority of people are good. Yep. And I do believe that they often get drowned out by um, a lot of the screaming on either side. And I, I look to kind of create a space, you know, I hope to create a space for other people to use their voices. I agree. Yeah. And I think, hope. That's why I'm so interested in hope. And I think there are so many people who want to do good and just don't know what yeah. to do, or they're nervous, yeah. say, like, they're are waiting for permission. Yeah. And I think that what we've seen with the protests over the past four years is that there are more people who realize that they can do something. You think about the women's march, you think about yeah. all the marches that have that have come up is that they, these people would have never stood in the street before. They just right. wouldn't have, you know? Yeah. And you stand in once and you're like, okay, I can do that. You know, like, and you see people like uh, with an awakening that I think is incredible. And I think also, don't be afraid of doing peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. Don't be, don't be afraid. You know, kind of, know that's that really the like the, the side and the road to freedom starts with peanut butter mm -hmm. and jelly. Okay, we have some questions like for uh, DeRay, I think, right? Yeah, one question from Christine Callis. How do we share our truth on social media without starting online war of words on our timeline? Amen. So that is the question is how do we uh, say our truth on social media and how do we not get 
this deluge of like horrendous comments. I found myself inundated with a lot of comments over the weekend. I'm like, whoa, you know. Because you were commenting in the hearings. Yeah, I was commenting, and you know, people respond with stuff that you're like, wow. <laughs> You know, like, wow, take it down. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I will say, I don't know if we're designed to get as much feedback as we get. That, like, there's something about, like, what does it mean to live in a constant cycle of feedback at your yeah. fingertips every time? So I do think some of it is, like, putting a healthy distance so that you're not just consuming all of that every moment. Like, I yeah, think that I is a real that part that of it. I think the second part is, like... Uh, being mindful about what we put out in the world and then standing behind it when we believe it, you know? So, like, you think about all the women and men who have talked about their stories of sexual assault recently. It's mm -hmm. like, there are a lot of people who are like, why are you saying that now? You should have said it then. It's like, it's true today. It was true then. And, like, there are a lot of reasons why people don't report. And we should just stand in that truth. And, like, we don't have to be subject to people's feedback in that way. And I've seen the good and bad of these social media platforms. The first person ever permanently banned from Twitter was banned for raising money to try and get me killed. So I've seen, you know, that part. And I've also seen the incredible power of the platforms to allow people to be heard who weren't heard before. And also you write in the book about... Um going from a place of fear where you were to absolute freedom like once you've been threatened or once yeah, you think you're, like, you're you're now that's really freedom too yeah. in a, in a yeah. funny or really weird, weird way, way. Yeah, yeah. but really like I'm not afraid of dying I'm not afraid of being arrested I'm not afraid of using my voice that's really what you also write about yeah, in here, no. your evolution yeah. to that place and like you know we were quiet and still got threatened right so yeah. Like, I might as well yell because <laughs> I tried the other way and it didn't work. Yeah, so the book is called On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope. And uh, it's really a great read. It makes you think. Uh, it makes you kind of wonder, are you doing enough? Are you curious enough? Are you um, out of your comfort zone enough? And I like that, that it made me a little uncomfortable while I was reading it. It made me wonder. Uh, where I could do more, how I could reach out more. So um, I thank you for making me a little bit uncomfortable on the plane. Well, thank you for me. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, you're doing good work. And I applaud you for getting out there and telling your story because uh, a lot of it's really personal. It's not just political. It's uh, all all politics is personal too. At the end of the day. Yes. So well, great to be here. Great to be here. Thank you. Get the book. <laughs>